In our staff meeting a couple of weeks ago, one of our staff members shared an event that once happened to a good friend of theirs. Now, their friend was at a party. He didn't know most of the people at the party, and as the evening progressed, this friend noticed a guy hovering around a particular young woman. Now, the guy wasn't being obnoxious or physically intrusive. It's just he was hovering around her, and she clearly looked agitated at him, and she wanted him to leave, just to leave her alone. That's what it looked like. So after watching this unfold for quite a while, the young man decided that he was going to step up, step in, and offer his assistance. So he bravely walked up to the two of them, and he said to the young woman, Excuse me, is this guy bothering you? She looked at him and said, That's my husband. Have you ever done something like that? Have you ever completely misread a situation? Every time something like that happens, it's because someone does not have the full context. Every time there's a misunderstanding like that, it's because someone is missing a piece of the big picture. Well, this identical dynamic often takes place with the story of Jesus. Many people misunderstand what they're hearing because they don't have the context surrounding his life. Well, today, we're continuing in a series we've entitled The Big Picture. It's a series dedicated to equipping people to better understand the context of the life of Jesus. Now, just like the person who parachutes into the middle of a movie has no idea what's taking place on the screen, the person who parachutes into the middle of the Bible will have trouble understanding what's taking place in the life of Jesus. So this series is designed to remedy that situation by providing people with the context, the backstory, the big picture regarding the life of Jesus. Now, we're seeking to accomplish this goal by dividing the entire biblical narrative into six main acts. Today, we find ourselves at Act 3. Now, before we raise the curtain on the third act of this biblical drama, let's remind ourselves of the territory that we've traveled so far. Act 1 was entitled, God Creates and Dwells with Humanity. In Act 1, we studied the first two chapters of the first book of the Bible, and we discovered God's intention and God's design for the world. We saw how God created a wonderful universe filled with beauty and potential. God's highest creation was humanity, creatures uniquely formed in His image, creatures uniquely designed to live in harmony with Him and with one another. And in the beginning, that's exactly what happened, until we reached Act 2. Act 2 was entitled, Humans Rebel and the Fallout Happens. It was during Act 2, in the third chapter of the first book of the Bible, where humanity decided to reject God and go our own way. By doing so, we introduced something into the universe that God did not design, that God never intended. Our decision to reject and rebel against God introduced the dynamic of sin, evil, and suffering into the human experience. These things were not the result of God's design. These things were the result of our rebellion. But even at our darkest moment, even at the moment when the powers of sin and death were being unleashed upon the world, even at the moment when the enemy of our souls seemed to have triumphed over us, God still provided us with a glimmer of hope. For it was during that dark moment, while speaking to the enemy of our souls, that God made this promise. He said, I will put enmity, or strife, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So the writer of Genesis was recording God's prophecy, his prediction of a future showdown. Sometime in the future, there would be a great battle, a battle between the descendants or the offspring or the followers of Satan and the offspring of the woman. Now, that was an incredibly unusual phrase. Her offspring, a woman's offspring. In the Bible, it's always the seed of the man. But in this one verse, it talks about the woman's offspring. So from the very beginning, it was clear that something, that someone very unique was being described. So from the very beginning, while God was predicting what sin would do to us, God was also promising what he would do for us. Now, as early as the third chapter of the first book of the Bible, God is promising that somehow, in some way, at some time in the future, 
he will send to the world a savior, someone who will suffer at the hands of our enemy, yet ultimately defeat our enemy and restore things to God's original design. Now, looking back over time, looking back over the big picture of history to date, we now know that this unique something was God coming to earth. We now know that this unique someone was Jesus of Nazareth, God in flesh, come to deliver us from the power of sin and death. And Acts 3, where we find ourselves today, is where the groundwork for the delivering of that promise begins to be laid. It's today, in Act 3 of the drama, where God initiates his redemptive plan. And how does God do that? Well, God creates the nation of Israel to deliver on his promise to rescue the world. In Genesis chapter 12, God chooses an apparently random man from an apparently random land to start moving things forward. Let's read it together from Genesis. It says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God suddenly appeared to Abram and Sarai, a childless couple living in what is today known as Iraq. Roughly 2,700 years ago, God told this couple to pack their bags and move from the land that they knew to a land that was unknown to them at that time, to a land he would later show them, to a land he would later give them. Today, that land is known as the land of Israel. Now, God told them that he was not only going to give them a land, but he was also going to give them children, and that he was going to turn their offspring into a great nation. And God told them that he would use that nation to bless the entire world. And as you continue to read the biblical account, that is exactly what takes place. As you continue to read the remainder of the book of Genesis, then the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, you will see God's plan begin to unfold. By the way, did you know that God is just as interested in your life as he was in the lives of Abram and Sarai? Did you know that God has plans and purposes for your life and your future, just like he did for Abram and Sarai? It's true. You say, Darren, I'm no Abram, I'm no Sarai. My walk with God can't be compared to their walk with God. Oh, really? You think so? You think that Abram and Sarai were a lot godlier than you are, and that's why God can't do for you what he did for them? Well, did you know that when God called them, they neither knew God nor did they worship God? In fact, did you know that according to the book of Joshua, when God called Abram, his family was worshiping other gods. Could it be, as you sit there, your life is a lot more like their lives than you realize? Perhaps, like them, your priorities are way off. Your values are all wrong. Things in your world are all messed up. Life is not unfolding as you hoped it would. If that's you, you have a lot in common with Abram and Sarai. If that's you, you are in the same place as they were when God called them. The only difference between you and them at this moment in time is your response to God. You see, when God called out to them, they said yes to him. Up until now, you've been saying no to him. They chose to trust God's plan. Up until this moment, you have been choosing to ignore God's plan. Well, know this. As certain as you can hear my voice today, on the authority of God's word, I can promise you this. God is just as interested in your life as he was in the lives of Abram and Sarai. God has plans and purposes for your life and your future, just like he did for the lives of Abram and Sarai. All that's missing, all that's lacking to unleash God's provision in your life is your decision to trust his promise, to say yes to God's plans, to embrace God's purposes. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that very thing when we conclude today's teaching. So get ready. Okay, 
let's get back to the biblical narrative. God creates the nation of Israel to deliver on his promise to rescue the world. He begins by choosing Abram and his wife Sarai. Abram and Sarai's names are eventually changed to Abraham and Sarah. You thought I was mispronouncing their names, perhaps. No, in Hebrew, the name Abraham means father of many, and the name Sarah means princess or woman of high rank. So the family of the newly named Abraham and Sarah miraculously grows and is organized into 12 distinct tribes under the united banner of the name Israel. By the way, the name Israel means struggles or strives with God. As the nation of Israel grows and the years pass, a severe famine in the region leads the Israelites to migrate south to the land of Egypt. After living in Egypt for a season, they then find themselves suddenly enslaved by the Egyptian pharaoh. At that time, Egypt reflected everything that had gone wrong with humanity. Egypt was filled with idolatry, injustice, and slavery. If you've ever watched Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments or the children's cartoon, The Prince of Egypt, you know a bit of the story. God raised up a man named Moses to deliver Israel from their Egyptian bondage and return them back to the land that God had promised to their father Abraham. It was through Moses that God led Israel into a legal contract, a covenant between God and Israel. We know it today as the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. Now, this ancient contract between God and Israel was filled with laws and regulations that were designed to teach Israel about the concept of purity, as well as to keep Israel from falling into the corrupt patterns and practices of the godless nations that were all around them. This is where we find many of the crazy-sounding laws and practices that confuse us today. Laws about not having tattoos or not eating pork or shrimp. Now, while such laws may sound strange to our ears in our culture today, they were given to Israel at a time and in a context where they would have made complete sense to them in reference to what was going on around them. It was also through Moses, as part of the Old Covenant, that God instituted the sacrificial system a system that mandated the killing of lambs and the shedding of blood. This was all done to visually portray two important realities to fallen humanity, the ugliness and the penalty of sin, which is death, and the need for some type of a savior. So the Old Testament sacrificial system accomplished both of those objectives, and it was instituted to and through the nation of Israel. So think in these terms. Israel was created by God to function as his voice, as God's object lesson, as God's delivery mechanism to fallen humanity. Because it was through the nation of Israel that God decided to deliver on his promise to redeem humanity and restore creation to his original design. So what happens next? Well, sadly, in spite of God's provision, Israel stumbles and fails as a nation. The Old Testament books of Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, they all tell the story. After Moses dies, a man named Joshua, his second in command, takes his place and leads Israel back to the promised land, the land they had not seen for 400 years. Upon their return, God commands them to clear the land of everything that was tied to the worship of false gods. However, instead of clearing the land, The Israelites further corrupt the land by joining in on the idolatry and jumping on the bandwagon of polygamy and immorality. Even Israel's best kings like David and Solomon fail miserably. And eventually, the leaders of Israel drive the nation into the ditch. God warns them over and over and over again. God calls them to turn back to him, but they refuse. The nation splits actually into Israel and Judah And then God allows both to be conquered and enslaved by surrounding nations. Once again, things looked incredibly dark. However, way back in Act 1, during the darkest moment when sin first entered into the world, God made a promise. Remember, God declared, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. 
God promised to send someone, someone born in unique circumstances, uniquely the product of a woman's offspring. And that promised someone would crush the power of sin and death that had been let loose through humanity's rebellion. God made a promise and God keeps his promises. Yes, Israel stumbles and Israel fails as a nation. However, all is not lost. Israel is scattered as a people, but through his prophets, God keeps hope alive. Rebellious Israel is invaded, removed from the land, and scattered all over the world. But God still doesn't give up on his plan. Isn't it good to know that even in the midst of our failures, God doesn't abandon us? I don't know about you, but as for me, there have been times in my life when I have stumbled and fallen, times when I have not done what I knew I should have done, times when God had every right and every reason to give up on me, to turn his back on me, but he didn't. Every time he continued to pursue me, every time he continued to reach out to me, to draw me back to his side, every time he continued to speak hope into my life. Well, in the midst of Israel's rebellion, God does the same. In the midst of Israel's rebellion, God continues to pursue them. God sends his prophets to them, men and women who speak on his behalf. And through his prophets, God reminds the nation of Israel that he still has a plan, that he still has a promise that is yet to be fulfilled. And it's through those prophets that God drops further hints about this coming Savior, this coming Redeemer. Through the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, God promises, and I quote, The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. What a bizarre prediction. A virgin having a baby. It's clearly an echo of the words from Genesis 3 about a woman's offspring. And centuries later, we see it happen in the incredible events surrounding Joseph and Mary and the birth of Jesus. The prophet Isaiah gives us even more clues regarding the life of this promised Redeemer. Again, 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah describes the one who is to come. Now, as we're about to read this extended passage, I encourage you to focus on what's being described here. If you're familiar with the events surrounding the death of Jesus, Open your Bible or take a pen and underline words or phrases that particularly jump out at you from Isaiah 53. Words or phrases that are direct descriptions of what would take place in Jesus' life centuries later. Let's read it from Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. In other words, frail, fragile, not this mighty, powerful warrior. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised, rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity, the sin of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? Who complained? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. 
Remember, those words were written seven centuries before Jesus was crucified on a cross, pierced, killed, then resurrected from the dead, defeating the power of sin and death. Centuries before it happened, the prophet Isaiah describes how a descendant of Abraham will bless the entire world, how a descendant of the nation of Israel will bear the sin of all humanity, and then afterwards he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Centuries before it happened, Isaiah describes precisely how Satan will wound his heel, but he will crush Satan's head. The Old Testament is filled with prophecies about this coming Savior. Mathematics and astronomy professor Peter Stoner calculated the mathematical probability of one person fulfilling just eight of those many prophecies. The odds were one in 10 to the 17th power. That's a one with 17 zeros behind it. In other words, the odds against it happening are huge, but it did happen in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Are you starting to see it? Are you starting to see the big picture? Jesus doesn't just parachute into the world out of nowhere. There's a context, there's a backstory, there's a big picture to everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did. Isn't God amazing? Isn't the love of God, the faithfulness of God incredible? God creates the nation of Israel to deliver on his promise to rescue the world. Israel stumbles and fails as a nation. They're scattered as a people. But through his prophets, God keeps hope alive. Even in the midst of Israel's failures, God still extends hope. Know this. What was true for Israel is equally true for you. Even in the midst of your failures, even at the darkest moments of your life, God will never abandon you. Oh, you may abandon him, but he will never abandon you. And that brings us to today's big idea, when we sum up the teaching in one phrase. Here it is. When you place your hope in Jesus, your failures are never final. When you place your hope in Jesus, your failures are never final. Perhaps, like the nation of Israel, you find yourself living outside of God's blessing and provision. Know that even there, even then, his love for you has not diminished. His plans for you have not changed. God will still send prophetic voices into your life, calling you back, drawing you home. If you want to answer the big questions in life, you need to grasp the big picture in life. As we move through the Bible, the big picture is getting clearer. A world that was created and designed to live in perfect harmony is defiled by our decision to reject and rebel against God. But God doesn't abandon us. God has a promise and a plan to redeem us, to restore us. So he creates the nation of Israel to deliver on that promise. But the people, the kings, the leaders of Israel resist and even outright reject God. As a result, Israel is scattered as a nation. But that's not the end of the story. God sends prophets to remind the people of his promise to send someone, a physical descendant of Abraham, a physical descendant of King David, and this promised person will rescue the entire world. We now know this person as Jesus of Nazareth. We now see hints of his coming throughout the Old Testament. We now see proof of his power in his resurrection from the dead. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. That part of the big picture is coming next week, when we turn the page to Act 4. When the moment that Israel has been waiting for, for centuries, finally arrives. The promised Savior and Redeemer steps into the world. Now, how that Savior and Redeemer is treated by sin-stained humanity, by his own people, leads to tragedy and triumph all at the same time. And that's what we will discuss next week when the curtain rises on act four of the big picture. Let's pray. God, I thank you that when I place my hope in you, my failures are never final. I thank you that you see my frailty, you see my faults, you see my rebellion, but you never turn your back on me. You are patient with me. You're patient with us. What's true of me is true of everyone who hears my voice right now. 
If you're watching right now and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, meaning you've not yet placed your hope in Jesus, well then your reality is a little bit different. You are living in your failures. You're being swallowed up by your failures. And if you die in that state, your failures will impact you for forever. God will not have abandoned you, but your abandonment of him will last forever. But there's hope. While you still have breath, you have an opportunity to place your hope in Jesus, to accept his gift of forgiveness and eternal life, and to trust him. And when you do that, your failures are never final because his grace and his transforming power will become alive and active in your life. So if you'd like to accept his gift, to invite his presence into your life, to place your trust, your hope in Jesus, pray with me right now as though my words were your words. Let's pray together. God, I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge my rebellion. I acknowledge I have turned my back on you. I have rejected you. I have rebelled against you. I don't want to live this way any longer. So I turn my back on my sin and I face you and your throne and your cross and your empty tomb. And I say, come into my life, cleanse me, forgive me, fill me with your spirit, begin to transform me from this moment on. Now I know I won't be perfect and sinless, but daily as I confess my sin and acknowledge it before you, you promise to be faithful to forgive me and cleanse me moment by moment. And God, would you give me the courage to act on this decision even before my head hits the pillow this evening? By the authority of the resurrected Jesus, I pray this prayer. Amen. Well, if you just prayed that prayer with me, congratulations. You are now a follower of Jesus. And the best advice I can give you is two things, really. First of all, tell somebody. If you know a follower of Jesus, someone who's tried to tell you about this good news of Jesus, Text them, call them, let them know of the decision you've made. Or you could also text the number on the screen right now and one of our pastoral staff will text you back. We won't phone you, we're not spamming you, we're not putting you on a mailing list or a call list, none of that will happen. We'll simply respond to you once and offer our services to you in any way that we can. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us today at Broadway Church. I hope you join us next week for Act Four of The Big Picture.